Good morning. My name is Lene Palmasano. I'm vice president of the Minneapolis City Council. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, October 5th. This morning, we have one honorary resolution to present, which we will do before taking up our regular order of business. It is Domestic Violence Awareness Month resolution, and I'm going to just come down there and ask if Mickey, Siri, Finn, and Alia will join me up front. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, you know, domestic violence is the hardest part of things that I see in my work as a city council member. It imp its impacts are devastating for victims and families and communities. This month, victim advocates, survivors of abuse, their loved ones and the surrounding community come together and mourn lives lost to domestic violence, celebrate the progress that has been made to end this epidemic and connect with others working to create change. Today, I want to acknowledge a couple of individuals who are working to create change in our community. The first is someone I've known for 10 years now, Mickey O'Kane. Mickey O'Kane lives in my community. Um, she's generously donated her time to raising awareness and funds for the Domestic Abuse Project. She's played a key role organizing the DuPont Luminaries Project in, in my ward where neighbors come together and shine a light on domestic violence, quite literally. This project has raised over $34,000 for the Domestic Abuse Project to date, and this year alone, Mickey's raised more than $10,000 to provide a year of child parent psychotherapy for 15 children and their parents, helping these families to form healthy attachments and prevent further violence. This is her 25th year of doing the DuPont Luminaries. Siri. Siri, works, Siri Erickson works at Tubman, an organization that has provided safety, hope, and healing in Minneapolis for more than 45 years. They support individuals and connect them to the resources they need in the wake of trauma, including relationship violence, sexual assault and exploitation, trafficking, addiction, mental health issues, and more. Thanks to the work of dedicated staff like Siri, Tubman served nearly 18,000 people in Hennepin County and the surrounding areas just last year. I also want to uplift the memory of Sarah Patrick, a victim of intimate partner homicide. Sarah resided in Uptown and was described by her friends as bright, witty, and smart. Her father described her as an incredible artist and painter. We're joined today by her friends, Finn McGarrity and Alia Khan, to share her story and honor her memory. Since Sarah's tragic death, Finn and Alia have been working to bring awareness to the impacts and prevalence of domestic violence. So thank you for being here and for your work in the community. Um, I'm going to read the resolution and then ask you each to say a few words. So, declaring October 2023 is Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the city of Minneapolis. Whereas National Domestic Violence Awareness Month was first declared in 1989 to acknowledge the more than 10 million adults annually who experience domestic and intimate partner violence in the U.S., and whereas domestic violence homicide is a public health concern that disproportionately affects women, particularly black, indigenous, Asian American, and Latina women, with every town for gun safety reporting that an average of 70 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner every month. And whereas over four and a half million women report being threatened with a gun by an intimate partner, and access to a firearm increases the risk of intimate partner femicide by at least 400%. And whereas despite its pervasiveness, currently no state or federal agency collects comprehensive data on domestic violence or intimate partner homicides, and whereas Violence Free Minnesota, a statewide coalition of programs working together to end relationship abuse, has been reporting on domestic violence homicides since 1989, whereas there have been 24 do documented cases of domestic violence homicide in Minnesota between January and September of, 20 of this year, including Logan Gregory Varnum, Kyla Bianca O'Neill, Messiah O'Neill, 
Manuel Bernold Jurado, Jennifer Yang, Adrian Montano Medina, Karina Dawn Woodhill, Med Madeline Jane Kingsbury, Don Shea Hardy, Joshua Anthony Owen, Manije Mani Starin, Antonio Lavar Moore, Sabrina Lee Schnoor, Angela Marie McClellan, Vicki Marie Salmonson, Yua V. Kang, William Lamont Hudson, Donica Marie Bergeson, Darisha Tilla Bailey Bath, Jean Harriet Mart, Sarah Catherine Patrick, Mary A. Corneliuson, Melanie Michelle Jansen, and Hannah Nicole Par Parmenter. And whereas, whereas there have been two cases of domestic homicide doc documented in the city of Minneapolis so far this year, and whereas October 15th is the memorial of Sarah Patrick, beloved daughter, sister, friend, and Minneapolis community member, and the most recent reported victim of intimate partner homicide in our city. And whereas the city of Minneapolis is committed to honoring the memories of those who are lost due to domestic violence by bringing an end to this preventable epidemic through investment in awareness, education, training, violence prevention and gun control, direct service, and policy change, now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby declare October 2023 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the city of Minneapolis, and that October 15th, 2023 be recognized as a day of remembrance for all victims of domestic violence and homicide. Thank you. Mickey, did you want to say a couple things? Thank you so much for letting me be here today. It's an honor. Um, DAP opened its doors in 1979, Domestic Abuse Project. That's what we call DAP. I've been with them, working with them at their side for over 26 years. In 1979, women's shelters were the only option available for people, women, who were dealing with domestic violence. If men were found guilty of abusing their partner, they might be arrested, they would rarely serve any lengthy punishment, and they definitely were not taught how to change their behavior. DAP was founded on the principle that abuse is a learned behavior and that it can be unlearned. As such, DAP was one of the very first nonprofits in the country to deal with rehabilitation. DAP also recognized that abuse was an intergenerational problem. The DAP philosophy is that with proper therapy, people can turn their lives around and heal their families. Without intervention, abusers are bound to repeat the behavior that they grew up looking at. When I started working with DAP, the statistic that was quoted was that one out of four women would experience domestic or sexual violence in their lifetime. Unfortunately, today that statistic is one out of three. The problem has gotten worse. It was exacerbated by the pandemic. Therapy services at DAP include every member of the family, from children as young as infants, through teenagers, to adult women and men. 90% of the participants who come to DAP who have used harm in their relationships report that they have not used harm again one year after therapy. 97% of victim survivors and youth say that they feel confident that they will be able to keep themselves safe after leaving DAPS programming. These are statistics we can be proud of, but it also makes the waiting lists very long. I've just learned one interesting statistic I wanna share. 70% of mass shooters are also perpetrators of domestic violence. I didn't realize that. I think it's quite sobering. It also says that reaching these men, diffusing their anger, goes beyond their immediate families. It goes into our communities. We may think that DV doesn't affect all of us, but it does. Personally or communally, we are all in this together. Thank you so much for supporting this mission. Thank you. Finn and Alia. Thank you, Count, uh, Vice President Palmasano, for letting us speak. 
Two months ago, on August 3rd, my best friend Sarah was killed by a former partner in an act of domestic gun violence. The day I got the call saying she had been shot in the head and was dead was the worst day of my life. I felt the floor fall out from beneath me, and I've been trying to regain my footing ever since. I met Sarah when I was 16 years old. She was the coolest girl I ever saw. She had lime green hair and was sporting bright orange skinny jeans. I instantly wanted to be her best friend. I remember her speaking sophisticatedly about a Quentin Tarantino movie while applying an excessive amount of ketchup on her cheese curds at Minneapolis Pride. The moment I met her, I knew I met someone incredibly special who was going to change my life forever. Sarah Patrick did just that. Over our 15 years of friendship, we lived together many times. She filled our home with warmth. We spent many nights staying up until the wee hours talking, and we passed days walking around the lakes together. We held each other through life's hard moments and laughed with jubilee through, during the joyful times. Sarah was brilliant, kind, and thoughtful. Her resilience held levity, and she held a sense of wonder for the world that was truly inspiring, considering the heaviness of the trauma she experienced. Sarah was true blue. She was my touchstone, and I will spend the rest of my life missing her and mourning uh, what was stolen from us. Audre Lorde said the personal is political. Domestic violence is not a private matter or offense, but rather a perpetual violence that fractures our community. The loss is, of course, personal, but its ripples extend far and wide. Sarah Patrick is a sister, daughter, friend, artist, server, bus writer, and movie fanatic who religiously frequented Minneapolis independent theaters and art establishments. She was a tour de force when it came to getting in front of the crowd at First Avenue. Whether your connection to Sarah was casual and brief, or like me, in intimate and lasting, our community is a little dimmer and less whole without her smile, talents, and spirit breathing in it. Thank you. Sarah Patrick lived with me and Finn off and on at various times over the past five years. I can't understate the impact that she had on me and truly everyone she came into contact with. She was a bright, funny, determined, resilient, kind, and loving person. She yearned for connection, and her openness, vulnerability, and warmth made it easy for her to find. She quickly made friends with people, winning them over with games of bananagrams, top model gossip, and gifts of her own artwork. As her most recent roommate Jordan said, although our friendship wasn't long, it felt like we had known each other for much, much longer. I'll always remember how sweet, gentle, and charismatic she was. She was a really good person, and I will always cherish that. Her childhood friend Emma described Sarah as one of the bravest, smartest, and most creative people that she knew, always encouraging her to be herself. I feel similarly. Sarah quickly befriended me, and over the course of birthdays, holidays, and most importantly, the day-to-day, -day, she became like family. I worked for years as a crisis advocate for domestic violence, so I knew the warning signs of intimate partner violence and recognized the patterns. But you never think that the worst will happen to someone you love. I saw Sarah trying to break the cycle, working through it with therapists, reading self-help books, and having late-night conversations with friends. I believe she had time to disentangle, heal, and build the bright future she was working towards and deserved. Like too many people, Sarah's big heart and care for others, even those who caused her harm, could eclipse concern for herself. And it is devastating that her love and care, which should have been sacred, was met with abuse and violence. But I try to remember that Sarah's murder is one day of her life. And in her entire 30, almost 31 years of living, she had family, friends, and a community who loved her as fiercely as she loved them. Just as I grieved the time that we were robbed, I will be grateful every day for the time with her that we were gifted. And then I also have a statement from her family. So from Chris and Deborah Patrick, remembering our daughter, Sarah. Sarah was the first of two daughters born to us in 1992. Our younger daughter, Lily, age 14, was very close to Sarah, and they connected regularly by phone and FaceTime. Sarah was bright, outgoing, and happy as a child. She attended Capitol Hill Magnet School in St. Paul and then Central High for two years before moving with us to Florida. While growing up, Sarah was active in art and drama and participated in sports of all kinds, including swimming, soccer, softball, karate, and downhill skiing, as well as ocean surfing and scuba diving while in Florida. Sarah returned to Minnesota for college and later paused her studies to attend her, to her health. She went back to school and completed an associate's at Minneapolis Community and Technical College in 2022 and had planned to continue studying toward a medical technician degree next year. Sarah was a beautiful person, both inside and out. She was a gifted graphic artist, expelling, excelling especially in painting, and had a unique sense of style. She was unfailingly kind to other people and formed deep, lasting friendships. Her sister Lily says, 
Sarah was always there for me and other people, and she was a very good listener. I felt I could talk with her about anything going on for me without being judged. I miss her so much. When Sarah last visited us in Florida last summer, we had a fabulous time together as a family. We were all looking forward to her next visit. The three of us love Sarah with all our hearts and will hold her close in those hearts for the rest of our days. Thank you. Siri, did you want to say a couple words? Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Siri Erickson, and I'm a community resource manager at Tubman. I am grateful for the opportunity to be here to connect with all of you, to honor Sarah's life, and to talk a little bit about domestic violence. I started working in domestic violence advocacy because it's work that I believe in. I believe in survivor advocacy and community organizing, and I know that domestic violence is a widespread issue, widespread issue that impacts all of us. It doesn't only impact survivors of violence, it impacts friends and family, coworkers and neighbors, and the community as a whole. As an advocate, I think that the work that we do is often challenging and emotional, and I try to look for moments of hope and opportunities for change in our communities. This year, Minnesota enacted a new law creating the nation's first Office of Missing and Murdered African American Women and Girls, and the White House recently established the first ever Office of Gun Violence Prevention to reduce gun violence in our communities. I'm hopeful about new efforts that we see in communities and local and state levels, and I also know that we have a lot of work to do as a community. At Tubman, I feel grateful to work in a space that feels inclusive. Uh, Tubman is an anti-violence and community-based organization. We work with people of all genders, all backgrounds, all ages, all cultural identities. We provide services in shelter and beyond shelter. We work in courthouses and schools, our youth outreach center located at Maplewood Mall, uh, community settings and homes. And we strive to meet people where they're at to reduce barriers related to transportation and access. Some of the programs that we offer include legal help, mental health and chemical health services, uh, support groups, youth programs, a 24-7 crisis and information line, housing, and more. Uh, we work in community and partnership with the people around us. Uh, each of our programs are co-created by the people that we serve. We have resources available if people are interested in learning more about Tubman or connecting with us. And I just want to say thanks again for having me today and the opportunity to connect with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's truly our honor as a city council to bring these important things to light. Did you want to just pause quickly and take a... Take a photo if you have anybody in the audience, or actually I saw you in the back. Would you be willing to take a couple photos for the people that are here today? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Council Vice President, for bringing that resolution forward this morning. Uh, domestic violence is a deep scourge on our society um, and here in our city as well. So um, thank you for that acknowledgement and recognition. Um, good morning. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council. And I will call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, October 5th. And um, we have dispensed with our domestic violence resolution. 
And so now I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Goodman. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Councilmember Osman. Present. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Shugtai is absent. Councilmember Chavez. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Vita. Present. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Thank you. Let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. Um, and I do want to just acknowledge that Councilmember Chuck Tai is not with us this morning um, and is um, dealing with some health issues, and we wish her the best. Um, next, we have the adoption of our agenda. Colleagues, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. I'll ask, are there any amendments to the agenda? Are there any amendments to the agenda? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Uh, take a motion and a second. Actually, do you want to make the motion and I'll, uh, I'll say, I'll make the motion to adopt the agenda. Second. <coughs> um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries in the agenda is adopted. The next item of business is acceptance of the minutes from the regular meeting of September 21st. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and the agenda, I mean, and those minutes have been accepted. Finally, we have the referral of petitions, communications, and reports to the proper community committees may have that motion please so moved second clerk please call the roll councilmember rainville aye councilmember goodman aye councilmember wansley aye councilmember johnson aye councilmember osmond aye councilmember payne aye councilmember koski aye councilmember chavez aye councilmember ellison aye councilmember vita aye vice president palmasano aye president jenkins aye there are 12 ayes that carries, and those matters have been referred. The next order of business is reports from our standing committees, beginning with the report from the Business Inspection, Housing, and Zoning Committee. And that report will be presented by the committee's chair, Council Member Goodman. Good morning, Madam President, members of the Council. The Business Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee is bringing 12 items forward for approval this morning. Item one is an application for liquor. Uh, expansion at Norway House. Item two is approving an application for Somali resettlement services, also an extended hours license and a rental hall license. Item three is approving an application for the Briar, which is on sale liquor and entertainment. Item four is an application for the Silver Fern, a similar thing, um, on sale wine, strong beer, no live entertainment. Item number five is the license fee schedule that was sent forward without recommendation. I'm going to pull that item for an amendment so I can move it forward. Item number six is a land transfer. Um, this is with uh, the Red Lake Band of Chippewa. Um, item number seven is granting consent to the nomination of Enrique Velasquez to be our new director of regulatory services. Item eight, our liquor license approvals, and nine are the renewals. Ten are the gambling license approvals. I, item number 11 is um, passing um, approval for Hennepin County to do some bonds for the labor retreat apartments at 124 4th Street Southeast. And item number 12 is granting a variance appeal and adopting the staff findings uh, for a property at 2648 Marshall Street Northeast. Special thank you to Councilmember Payne for literally working this out, which is exactly how it should be. Um, and really, really happy about the ward work that was done on item number 12. Uh, so I will move all items uh, one through four and six through 12, holding off on item number five for an amendment. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman has uh, move that committee's report and i am just not clear are you pulling item number five 
Uh, yes, I'm holding off on item number five because I have an amendment so that it can be moved forward with recommendation. Thank you. So committee, I mean, um, council member Goodman has moved that committee's report uh, withholding item number five for a separate vote and amendment. And uh, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, uh, and I will recognize Councilmember um, Goodman on item number five. Thank you, Madam President. First, let me say congratulations to Mr. Velasquez. Uh, we are very much looking forward to working with you and have very high hopes that you will be able to be as successful as you have been in your previous roles in the city, leaning into this extremely difficult role. We have confidence in you, and you can see that from the vote here today. So thank you for being here today. Um, on item number five, uh, we had a public hearing on the license fee schedule. There were some questions about a couple of items. It was moved forward without recommendation. In front of you, colleagues, is um, the adopted license fee schedule with the following amendments. Um, adjusting the rental license per unit license fee for properties with four or more units from the proposed $5 increase to a 2% increase um, for the 2023 unit fee. This would raise the base license by $5, but it would not raise the every additional unit by 33%. And um, I had a very good meeting with staff to discuss maybe how this could be handled in the future better for larger buildings versus small buildings. And they have all of these interesting ideas about how they would handle it going forward. Um, so for now, I'm comfortable with the 2% per unit increase. I'll remind everyone these are tier one properties that have no problems and are not inspected annually either. Uh, so I am not anxious to ra raise the fees 33%. Um, In addition to that, I'm moving to postpone section five, animal control of the license fee schedule um, till the next council meeting. Um, one of the things we noticed in the license fee schedule, I'll just give you an example, under animal care and control, um, we actually charge $1,000 to adopt an exotic bird. So guess how many exotic birds have been adopted in the past 20 years? Zero. <laughs> Might be because it's $1,000. So what ends up happening is we give the exotic birds to a rescue who are better at dealing with exotic birds, quite frankly, anyway. Another good example would be we charge $50 to adopt a gerbil or a hamster or a guinea pig. Well, no one is paying $50 for any of those little reptiles, and we're ending up giving those to rescues. So it seems like there's a few things that we can clear up here rather than leaving the fee schedule the same. I was tempted to just make my own changes, but I'm a geeky about process, as you know, so I'm just asking to postpone this on the floor of the council while I work with staff to try to figure out what might make it um, easier for us to get these animals out the door. Um, because the cost for us in taking care of them um, is a problem. And if we're charging a fee that's preventative, um, it might make some sense to change that fee. So uh, I have had the opportunity to speak to Mr. Velasquez about this, although it was this morning. Uh, and I did speak with uh, Carolyn Harfeld about it yesterday afternoon. So I just didn't feel like I could make changes that I felt were appropriate. If you have interest in discussing these animals and their fee schedule, please look me up. Happy to have anyone else work on it as well. So Madam President, the amendment is in front of you. Uh, I'm moving the entire staff recommendation with the change in rental license fees and postponing the animal care and control fees on the floor, and that will come forward in the next council meeting. I'll second both of those. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Goodman. And Councilmember Goodman has moved this amendment to the 2024 license fee schedule. It's been properly seconded by uh, Council. Vice President Palmasano, are there any comments or questions? Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? And on clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. 
Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Uh, thank you. That item carries, and that completes the biz committee report. Next, we have the report from the. Um, I, I'm sorry. Our next committee of report is from the committee of the whole, and that will be presented by the committee's chair, Vice President Panasano. Thank you. We have two items coming from Committee of the Whole this cycle. The first is the Municipal Special Assessment Process Analysis. It's a um, direction to our City Auditor's Office and the Policy and Research Group. The second is our 2024 Council Transition Calendar. It just helps get us through until the next Council can formally adopt uh, a full calendar for the year. I'll move both of those items. Thank you, uh, Council Vice President Pomisano and um, Council Member, Council Vice President Pomisano has moved that committee's report. Are there any questions, comments from my colleagues? Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and that item is adopted. I do want to recognize that we have been joined by Council Member Chuck Tai. Good morning. Uh, and our next committee report is the Policy and Government Oversight Committee. And that report will be presented by Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. The Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 19 items for approval uh, and referring. Um, and one is going to be subject to a closed session, uh, I believe. So um, item number one is a gift acceptance from the National Board of Public Health Examiners of Travel Expenses. Two is a gift acceptance from the Midwest Climate Resilience Conference of Travel Expenses. Three is a gift acceptance from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy of Travel Expenses. Four is accepting a bid for hauling and disposal of waste materials. Five is accepting a bid for Fridley Softening Plant Rail Area Structure Rehabilitation. Two is accepting a bid for hazardous tree removal. Uh, seven is authorizing master contract with uh, Good Works Consulting LLC for belonging, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism learning and organizational development services. Eight is authorizing a master contracts with various vendors for workplace investigations services. Nine is authorizing contract with Tyler Technologies Inc. to provide a computer-assisted uh, mass appraisal system. Ten is authorizing a contract amendment with uh, ICS for project representative services for the city hall office space uh, renovation project. Um, 11 is approving the legal settlement um, for uh, Joe Casper and Demia Casper versus the city of Minneapolis and Alan Cobb. Items 12 through 19 are legal settlements related to workers' compensation claims. And again, item 17 is the subject of our closed session today, so I won't be moving item 17. Uh, <clears throat> item 19 is authorizing a con, uh, sorry, <clears throat> sorry, um, uh, item number 20 is authorizing a contract with Zen City Technologies, uh, U.S. Inc. for Community Perception Survey. Um, and so with that, I'll move approval of all these items except item 17, um, and, um, and I actually, you know, I actually also think that item number 20 should be pulled for a separate vote. I think there's enough sort of, uh, 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 I, I, I think that'll be requested anyway. So I just was going to ask for item 20 to be pulled for a separate roll call vote. Thank you. Council Member Ellison has moved the committee's report, um, pulling items number 17 and 20 for a separate vote. I see um, in queue for comments or questions, Council, Council Vice President Pomisano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Council Member Ellison didn't move forward item number 17, but I do think that after we've completed our closed session consultation, 
we might be ready to act on that. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Council Vice President. And uh, next in queue is Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. I'd also like to pull out 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18 for a separate vote. Those can also probably be taken on the same vote, but separately from 17 and 20. Um, so, items 12 through 16? Correct. And then 18. But not 14. Mm -mm. 14. Not 14. Yeah, not 14. So 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. And 19. So I'm, I'm sorry, Council uh, Member Chavez, I'm not sure. Are, we, are you asking, are you requesting to vote on those as one item or each item for a separate vote? Uh, thank you, Council President Jenkins. I'll just, I'll say it again. Uh, I want to pull out for a separate vote, and these can be the same vote because I'm assuming we're going to be, some of us are going to vote no on all these items, and I'm trying to make it easier for process. If we want to vote separately on each individual one, happy to do so. 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18, I want to pull out on, for a separate vote because I want to vote no. And I want to make it easier for the clerk to be able to uh, put that down for the record. Did I also hear number 19 on that? That was an accident, no, not 19. 12, 13, 15, 16, 18. Yep. Madam President, it sounds to me the first motion we have is the POGO report items 1 through 11. I heard no objections on any of those. Thank you, uh, Clerk Carl. And um, if there's no further discussions on items 1 through 11, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on that issue. And those items. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. It carries, and those items uh, are adapted. And um, so now we are on items 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, I do see Council Member Ellison has um, put himself in queue. Council Member Ellison. Am, uh, am I correct in, in hearing that items 14 and 19 also had no objections? So. And 17, I, I think. No, 17 is a closed session. Yep, so it's, it's uh, 14. It's the only one in the list I don't have included on this. 19. Yep. 14 and 19, I think, wouldn't have any objection. So I just, I figure we could maybe move those before we get into this other discussion. But I'll defer to the president and the clerks. Um. So we are now, Mr. Clerk, if you don't mind helping to sure. identify what it, this. Um, it seems like we're ready to vote on the POGO report items 14, which is the workers' compensation claim with Michael Vass, and number 19, which is the workers' compensation claim from Kathy Cooper, and that those two could be voted on together. Um, clerk, please call the roll on items number 14 and 19. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, and those items are adopted. Next, we are voting on. Um, if what I we have. have in front of us, items number 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, 
Council Member Chavez, do you have any comments to make on these items? Uh, thank you, Council President Jenkins. I was just pulling them out so I could vote no and make it easier for the clerks. Thank you. Uh, clerk, if you see no further um, comments or questions or discussion, clerk, please call the roll on those items. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Nay. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. No. Council Member Chavez. No. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 10 ayes and three nays. Those items carry. Um, and I believe that completes. Number 20. Pogo number 20. This is the contract proposed with Zen City Technologies for Community Perception Surveying, um, listed as number 20 on the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, so we are now on item number 20. I'm not sure who pulled that item for discussion, but if we could have Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I pulled this item. I, uh, it was on um, POGO's uh, uh, a couple of cycles ago, uh, we delayed it to get some more information and to maybe ask some questions and see um, if there wasn't maybe a more appropriate home and audit or, or, or somewhere else for this contract. I, uh, you know, I think that taking the contract at face value, you know, I could see a, this kind of uh, data playing a role, um, but it's half a million dollars. It does feel like uh, uh, perception surveys it is, for at least for me, not rising to the level of um, of uh, priority. Uh, and I'd li I'd like to see some execution of some of the things that we think will change perceptions before we're sort of taking a measure of perception. I think that we can all get a sense uh, through a lot of the community engagement that we do what some of the perception issues are within MPD, but honestly within uh, uh, for the whole city. Uh, and I'm not sure that we need this kind of uh, data at this moment. Um, I also, um, I also uh, at least to, to my understanding thus far, this is not a requirement of the, um, of any of the uh, uh, consent decrees that we're uh, either under or, or going to be under. Uh, and so uh, I know that there's gonna be a lot of um, uh, oversight with those, and I'd love to see some of that get executed as well before we're sort of taking inventory of, uh, of, 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 per, of perception of the department. So that's why I pulled it. Um, that's why I'll be voting against it today. Uh, again, it's not a, an indictment on Zen City or anything like that, but uh, I think this is, uh, uh, it's hard for me to understand um, how this would rise to the level of priority, especially uh, for half a million dollars when we're already pouring so much money into, uh, into the department and into reforms and into the consent decrees. So that's all. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Councilmember Ellison. Next in queue is Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I originally had a huge amount of hesitation with this contract because I was under the impression that it was um, doing some social media scanning to get real-time sentiment analysis. And that felt very much like surveillance, but I want to thank the chief for setting up a uh, one-on-one -on -one with the vendor. They were able to walk me through a lot more of the capability of the platform. And I, I actually do see the value of this, especially getting some baseline data so that when we do start doing some of these interventions, um, that we can actually see what is the difference of those perceptions. At this point now, my hesitation is, I don't think the platform, well, I, and I should say this, I have a background in enterprise software and I have a background in digital advertising. And what this platform does is essentially produce a survey that they put digital ad spend behind so that we're doing this kind of continuous surveying about sentiment. And it's an opt-in thing. It's just an ad on Instagram that you click on and say you like or don't like the police, essentially. It's, it's actually um, something that I think we can get a baseline around doing something a little bit less sophisticated than this platform. Uh, and I think 
it shouldn't be exclusive to the police. So one of the things that this platform has the capability to do is not just get the sentiment and perception of how the police are doing, it can get uh, uh, how the city is doing. And so I think that if we're gonna go into a platform that is this sophisticated, or at least this expansive, we shouldn't narrow it just to the police department. And I think one of the things about this platform is we need to have a level of maturity as an organization to be able to leverage this kind of data. And we used to have a team that did this stuff. We, this is actually what we did at the very beginning of developing BCRs. We did a survey to get some perceptions around the role of police as it related to mental health responses. And we did the data analysis on our team. We don't have those staff members here anymore as a part of PMI. We are rebuilding PMI right now. We do have some analysts. I think it would be good for those analysts to get their, their hands dirty a little bit, developing maybe a, a, a little bit more of a simplistic approach to getting baseline data using something as basic as um, building out a survey monkey and putting some ad spend behind it. And I think we could do that for actually something quite robust for $100,000 rather than $500,000. So I think that there is some more work that we should be doing on our side to get to that baseline before you know committing this much money. But I am open to this process. But today, I think I'm a no. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. Um, next in queue is Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. And I appreciate that this item was held over for a cycle at POGO so we could get additional uh, conversation around it, some presentations to talk with the vendor and to uh, hear the vision behind this. I will note for the public watching, even though this is a $500,000 contract on our agenda, it is actually, uh, broken out over multiple years, and the city can cancel it at any time. And so it's $166,000 a year. If MPD goes three months, six months, doesn't find value in it, we can cancel. And we don't owe the remainder of the $500,000. So I think that is an important detail. You know, look, we have a new chief. He's trying some new things. I personally think we should give him some space to try. And that doesn't mean that he gets a blank check from the city council. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't scrutinize things, but this seems reasonable. He is trying to use data to figure out, you know, if things that they are doing are working, if the public is noticing, if the community is noticing, if the feeling of safety is higher. They're also taking uh, evidence-based data scientists designed approaches around how to use this data to put in actionable changes. And so I think there's an opportunity here. Hopefully this tool will uh, provide value. And if it doesn't, I expect that they're gonna pull the plug on it. But I think let's give it a try. A lot of other cities are doing it and they're finding value in it too. And hopefully we will. So I support this item and I'd encourage my colleagues to. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Uh, next in queue is Councilmember Osmond. Thank you, Madam President. I like to hear more about the chief and um, just how how this will help him do his job better and improve the the safety of the residents. Um, this is Chief, please. Good morning, Chief O'Hara, and welcome. Good morning, Council President. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so yes, uh, you know, th this is really urgent uh, to me. Um, last Friday, made a year ago, that I made my trip to Minneapolis where the mayor announced my nomination. And, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but like the council member said, we don't have a baseline of a lot of these issues. And this isn't just about police, uh, perception of police in community but that is a important and that's a really big deal to a lot of residents here. But it's also about senses of safety. Um, I mentioned to the other committee, uh, the last committee meeting here, you know, obviously we know very well uh, where um, the most serious crime is happening, crimes of violence and, and so on. But there's a whole lot of crime that goes unreported as well. 
Uh, and oftentimes, the only way to know about that is through surveys. And so these, these types of things, I, I, I think, yeah, you know, I'm the police chief, so this type of stuff is the most important stuff in the world in this city to me, but I think it's also very important to a lot of the residents. Um, and it's data that can be available for everyone. Uh, I've spoken to the Department of Neighborhood Safety, um, and it's information that is helpful to them as well. The Director of uh, Performance uh, Management and in in Innovation also uh, agrees that this is information that, that is helpful to their work. Um, because just crime and perception of crime and feelings of safety and where that's happening and being able to see that, to measure that in some consistent way over time is helpful on an operational level. Um, and that's just information that we completely don't have. We have anecdotal stories. You know, you, you know, we all get calls from people who are most likely to call us, but we're not hearing from the majority of our residents. Um, and, and you know, other stakeholders, people that actually don't live in the city but are here consistently, and their cell phones are here consistently. Um, and I think it's just, um, it's important enough uh, and it's urgent enough um, that I've been trying to find some way, uh, including, you know, going to university and going to some of these foundations to help us, uh, you know, engage in survey processes. But this is kind of the one thing that I was able to find that's something that we could use on a more operational level. We need to do bigger things and we'll likely be required to do bigger things um, in terms of more robust, you know, research-based surveys. But that's stuff that takes a long time. And then we'll find out what happened, you know, like a year later. This is something that we'd be able to have uh, consistently on an operational level and kind of see, uh, based on different neighborhoods, how we're doing. And we might see problems we might totally not be aware of. Um, it's just, uh, it, it's something, again, that I think is just urgent because, you know, those two things, crime, safety, and, and residents' perceptions of our officers are the most important things for me. Thank you, Chief, uh, for being here. Are there other questions? Thank you. Osmond? No, thank you, Chief. Um, again, thank you, Chief. Uh, next in queue is Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Chief, I'll be voting for this. Uh, I want to support you. I want to give you the tools you need to succeed. But I also want to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to the awards presentation last night, hearing the stories of all those brave officers and the courage that they uh, amplify when they serve us. Especially, I wish uh, many of you could have been there uh, to hear about the officer of the year in the third precinct. That young man is doing one heck of a job patrolling those streets. And I was so proud to see the first precinct dog watch get the citation award, uh, the unit citation. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the great job you're doing and all of the Minneapolis police officers. And I will be voting for this. Thank you, Councilman Rainville. Are there any other comments or questions from my colleagues? Um, seeing none, I, I will just echo uh, Councilman Payne's initial comments that we really need a baseline in order to understand once we get the results, the, the beginning perception and the, then the subsequent perception as it hopefully grows and changes. Um, otherwise, it seems sort of um, inconsequential to do the work if we don't have the baseline. So um, I am in support of this uh, item as well. And seeing no further discussion, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on item number 20. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. No. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Ar Cal no, sorry. <laughs> Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. No. Councilmember Chavez. No. Councilmember Ellison. No. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are eight ayes and five nays. That item carries and that completes most of the POGO committee report. We will be discussing item number 17 um, at some time in the very near future. 
Um, so that brings us to our next committee report, uh, the Public Health and Safety Committee, and that report will be presented by the Chair, Council Member Vital. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward four items. Item one is accepting a grant from the CDC for racial and ethnic approaches to community health. Item two is accepting a grant from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to implement prevention strategies for countering violent extremism using public health methods. Item three is accepting <coughs> additional grant funds from the Minnesota Department of Health for Family Home Visiting Services. And item four is directing the city auditor to conduct an analysis of municipal strategies to deter and prevent auto theft. I'll move for approval of these items. Thank you, Councilmember Vital. And Chair Vital has moved that committee's report. And I see Council Member Payne in queue for discussion. I'd like to pull item two for a separate vote and discussion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Council Member Payne has requested to remove item number two for separate discussion and vote. Um, clerk, please call the roll on items one, three, and four. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, and uh, I will recognize Councilmember Payne on item number two. Thank you, Madam President. I looked into the background of this program and found that it, it's something I can't sit well with. And I think Councilmember Wanzi raised some of these issues in um, committee, uh, but this is really focused on black and brown communi communities, very, fo very much focused on Muslim communities. And I mean, I just have to share a personal anecdotal story. I mean, during the unrest in 2020, uh, in my little sleepy corner of Northeast Minneapolis, it was actually very quiet, but I actually stayed up all night every one of those nights because I'm one of the very few black people that live in my community. And I wasn't worried about uh, Antifa coming and setting fires. I was worried about being a recognizable black man in a white neighborhood. And I was worried about white supremacists coming and finding me. So I vigilantly stayed up all night, every night, terrified. I, I was terrified. That's terror. And this grant doesn't address that type of terrorism at all. And it's not focused on that type of issue at all. And I think that um, I'm certainly, I feel more safe around my East African neighbors than I do around uh, somebody who associates with the Boogaloo Boys. There is a person down the street that uh, is associated with neo-Nazis. That was something that was kind of a firestorm in my neighborhood. And so um, I think we need to be more, I don't know, timely and relevant about what the actual risks of terrorism in America are today. And so I, I don't feel confident voting for this. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, Council President Jenkins, I'm also very concerned about this grant previously known as the Counter and Violent Extremism Program, CVE, and now the rebranded with similar skepticism, the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Grant Program. My constituents, in particular who are Muslim, have repeatedly communicated with my office about the broken relationship with the U.S. Department of State and this program where they have felt surveilled and targeted. This grant will be in East Phillips, Ventura Village, Central, and Bryant that have a big Muslim community, which is also a big concern of why these particular neighborhoods are being chosen. And there have been accusations from my constituents, people that have talked to me, that they have felt uh, that they are being targeted as Muslim Americans and the minimization from these grants to go after far-right extremism. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, at the end of your comment, Council Member, did you say it excludes far-right extremism? I, I was talking about how my constituents have talked to me and have made 
comments about how they have felt that as Muslim Americans, they have this, these grants have minimized work to go after far-right extremism and instead have gone after folks that are in the Muslim community. Got it, thank you. Uh, Council Member Allison. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, you know, and I guess just to piggyback on Council Member Chavez's point, uh, especially uh, Council Member Wansley uh, very pointedly mentioned how this was gonna be focused in you know, black and and, uh, and and mostly black and black immigrant communities. Uh, CVE was something that was incredibly divisive in um, our communities a couple of years ago. Um, and I think that it promotes uh, this idea um, that uh, that there are parts of our city that are not, um, that, are, that, are, that are fostering terrorists, that are creating terrorists. Uh, I think it sends the wrong message. I think it creates the wrong idea. Um, and I think that it can be quite insidious by how it leverages the need for youth programming and, and targeting youth and services for youth uh, as a way to uh, surveil them and eventually accuse them uh, of things. That's how it's been used in the past. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and so, yeah, without, without a considerable understanding of how this would be any different uh, and, and being unconvinced that it would be much different, uh, I also won't be supporting this today. Thank you, Councilmember Asman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have a strong um, disapproval of this kind of tactics. I think our community, Muslim community, minority community, have been targeted um, since September 11 in the name of, you know, extreme uh, prevention of extreme terrorism. Um, Minneapolis uh, has a large population of. Uh, East African uh, Muslims that practice, uh, and you know this kind of uh, amount or this kind of tar specific targeted has an is, is an issue. Um, Muslim communities, um, you know, have been targeted. Their worship places have been targeted in, in general, but also this uh, kind of surveillance never brought any. Um, uh, you know, any, any, anything good to, to, to the community. And um, I would prefer that um, we really look into what we're voting for and um, single in one community in the name of uh, terrorist prevention. Um, I have a, a place is Ventura Village in, 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 in the area of that, that live. This is what, what the community is, is fear of, fearful about it. Uh, in, in the time of, uh, uh, President Donald Trump time, we had it the toughest. Um, and um, right now there's, uh, you know, fear of that, uh, just uh, deportation, a different way of uh, community feels really that they're, they're, not, they're not being protected. And I think the city of Minneapolis have taken the oath to be a, a safe city for all. And um, I'm really uh, concerned uh, this targeted specific and I don't see any any good that it will bring um, so yeah I will be voting against this and I hope that um, all of you consider um, the kind of impact and message it sends to the communities thank you thank you Councilmember Member Chuck Tai um, thank you madam chair um, you know I think for folks uh, who have not lived in communities that have um, that have experienced programs like CVE, it might be hard to understand why this feels like such a big deal. So I wanna just shed some light into why this is um, a really big deal because you might be thinking to yourself, we're just accepting some money from the federal government for violence prevention programs, what's the issue with that? We like violence prevention work, we fund it all of the time. The issue, um, and I'll say this as a person who grew up in post 9-11 America um, and, and like spent most of my childhood and my teenage years right as as a youth that was targeted by a lot of anti-terrorism um, programs cve or countering violent extremism um, was a post 9 11 strategy by the federal government and it included a lot of different things but some of it was grants that were created by the department of homeland security like this one is 
when it first um, when it first came to exist, there was actually a lot of um, it, it wasn't perceived as a negative thing within our community right away, right? Um, for a while, it, because it was it was money that was being given to mosques and organizations, nonprofits, um, youth leaders um, within our own community for us to run. Um, you know, after school programs, except what they said to us, what the federal government said to us was, yeah, 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 here's some money, you run your after school program, just in return, keep a list of every single child and their address and their, and, and their age and where they live and all of these things. And then those programs turned into surveillance programs. And then um, in this city, in Minneapolis, kids my age are serving out 30-year sentences for crimes they didn't commit, for entrapment cases by the FBI, and those were, th that was, th it, they took the easy, um, or like they accepted plea deals in order to be able to um, have some hope of, um, of, of like getting out of prison at some point in their lives. That's what this program does. That's what, um, that's what you know, harmless money for violence prevention against terrorism turns into for our community, it turns into hyper surveillance. It means our kids are watched like they are a problem um, and, and like they've committed crimes and we shouldn't do that. We should not relive what happened to our community again and again and again. We should learn all our lesson from what happened with CVE and the way in which it destroyed our community, the way in which it surveilled our children and tore them apart from their families and the way in which it was, it was harmful to the perception of safety within our own neighborhoods um, and like I'm gonna vote against this program and I don't I don't I don't think anyone should vote for this program thank you Councilmember Goodman uh, thank you madam chair I don't know anything about this I wasn't in committee I didn't hear a discussion in committee I was in committee of the whole I didn't hear a discussion in committee of the whole so all of this information is new to me at this moment and I don't see the health department here so I don't really have a way of judging whether or not it makes sense or not I think the most persuasive argument to me came from, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it was Councilmember Chavez who pointed out, this is happening in his ward and he doesn't like it. <laughs> maybe it was not you, but maybe it was. Um, this is something the health department has promoted. It's not coming from MPD. I'm not comfortable voting for something when the council members of the ward know that the activity is going on in their ward and they're not comfortable with it. But I would like to hear from the health department. There was no question about it in committee. There was no bringing this up. Well, maybe someone raised a question. I, I wasn't in committee, I have to be fair. Um, but there was this never came up at Committee of the Whole, which is supposed to be the place where items come up that if we have questions about, and I feel like um, at least the health department should have an opportunity to fill us in. I do tend to uh, go along with the council members of the ward who are affected, and so Council Member Chavez's comments are meaningful. And I guess what the public should hear is that everyone doesn't come into the council with a predetermined opinion about how they'll vote on everything. Sometimes a conversation like this is super useful. I don't think I have this program operating in my ward, so I'm not the best to be able to judge. But I'm just wondering how do we want to have the health department come down and say something? I mean, this requires nine votes. I can count. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure it's even worth it. Um, I, but just out of respect for them, I feel like they should make their case rather th because they've done this work already to get this grant. So it's kind of like saying to them, thanks for doing all this work. We're not going to take it seriously. So I kind of feel like they should say something, but I'll leave that to the group. I just wanted to note that I don't know enough to make a learned decision at this moment. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. And Councilmember Johnson, if it's okay, can we hear from the chair of the committee? Certainly, Madam President. Uh, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Councilmember Wansley did raise some concern in committee. Councilmember Goodman, uh, the health department did speak to those concerns, and I personally thought we had cleared things up. I, I don't know where Councilmember Wansley landed. She can speak for herself, but... Um, I would like for us to have more discussion in committee if necessary or committee in the, of the whole with the health department. Uh, we need nine votes. 
this seems like it's gonna fail. Clarity would be good to have um, before we take a final vote if my colleagues are okay with that. Um, um, what's the request? To send it back to committee either PHS or Committee of the Whole, so everyone can have an opportunity to speak to this. So are you making a motion to return this to committee? Yes. Second. So Chair Vitao has uh, moved to return this item to committee for further discussion. It's been properly seconded by Council Member Johnson. Um, Next in queue on the motion to refer to committee is Council Member Wansley. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I just wanted to provide some further clarification. Um, as Council Member uh, Vitaal noted, we did receive, um, you know, answers or responses to questions that I specifically raised in committee about this item. Um, and I voted against it because the questions did not receive an adequate response. Um, but if you also want to know uh, what's the perspective of the health department, um, and I see interim COO uh, Heather Johnson running out possibly to get them, another way to see that is literally just read the RCA or the RAIA. One of the key components that's highlighted right now, I'm reading it myself, the pillar of prevention should be the core of building a healthy community, even if the activities that strengthen it are not specifically labeled as CVE or carried out by entities exclusively devoted to CVE. Even in the RAIA that our staff and the health department prepare for this item acknowledged a connection to the CVE program that again has historically targeted Muslim, black, and black youth primarily, as Councilmember Chugs High and Councilmember Osmond so eloquently highlighted. So it's very concerning that, and this was raised in, even in committee, that there's still this blind spot when we're considering receiving grants of how grants are promoting continued Islamophobia, promoting um, or not countering hate crimes that's actually coming from other segments of our communities, predominantly uh, right-wing communities, uh, Caucasian right-wing communities. Like, we've seen hate crimes also rise amongst white supremacists way greater than we've seen amongst Muslim black youth. So I also will encourage uh, council members to check out the RAIA, the RCA. It's also pretty explicitly um, documented about what this is, affiliated with and the harm for work that is connected to CVE. Thank you. Um, and I apologize, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you for ceding your time. And I will recognize you prior to Councilmember Payne. Madam Chair, I was going to move this item back to committee. So I'm glad that the chair uh, was able to do that and was happy to second it. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam President. I'm happy to support referring this back to committee. I, I will say that um, Council Member Wansley raised these issues and we did have a component of this conversation. At that time, the health department answered it in a way that I felt comfortable to vote yes for it in committee. Um, however, it's through deeper research on the background of this program and I think Council Member Chugtai really, really highlights this. It all sounds well and good, it sounds great. This is just dollars coming into the community, but the issue is that those dollars can then get flipped and twisted and then converted into a surveillance program. And so like, I'm happy to continue this conversation in committee. I think I've been convinced that this program is not something I can support, but um, maybe you all arrive at that same place after a deeper discussion. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. Uh, next in queue is Council Vice President Palmasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, similar to Councilmember Payne, I heard our colleagues' um, concerns, but then felt like the health department had sort of satisfied them at the time. Um, I appreciate all the things that my colleagues have have said here on the dais this morning. Um, that we've that doing this is minimizing other kinds of, of extremism. Um, I, I appreciate that. There are serious accusations 
and probably facts around the surveillance here. Um, and like Councilmember Osmond said, I imagine and will trust that this these programs were put into place post 9-11. Um, we didn't have this kind of a discussion at committee, so I, I would like to bring it back to committee, but I also remember, I mean, I, I think we've accepted these kinds of grants sort of routinely over the years, um, and I think that maybe a larger discussion of it um, might help us make a, a larger change of course um, on, this, on this work. So on a broader level, I mean, let's just not iron it out for this one, but let's um, maybe also change our filters as to how how grants come forward to us and say that something like this uh, that includes elements of surveillance in this way are just not, aren't something we want to consider in the future. So um, I also would appreciate if it goes back to the committee that it came from, simply because the committee of the whole uh, meeting next cycle is extraordinarily long. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member, uh, Council Vice President Palmasano. Next in queue is Council Member Vita. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. I would rather it come back to PHS, and I'll make sure that my office sends out an invitation for everyone to attend the meeting when it comes back up. Thank you. So the motion before us is to refer um, this item number two targeted violence and terrorism prevention grant to um, the Public Health and Safety Committee. Seeing no further discussion on that motion, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries, and that item is referred back to its home committee, Public Health and Safety. And that completes the PHS uh, committee report. And uh, the next report before us is the Public Health and Infrastructure Committee report presented by Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is bringing forward four items this cycle. The Public Works Infrastructure Committee is bringing forward four items this cycle. The first is the water and sewer service line repair assessments. The second is the application for 2024 State Park Road Account Program Funding Solicitation. The third is an amendment to the cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for proposed multimodal improvements along Lake Street and Lagoon Avenue. And item number four is a legislative directive for an analysis of a new program to provide funding for water and service line failures. And I will go ahead and move all of these items. Thank you. Council Member Johnson has moved the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee report. Are there any comments or questions? Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and um, that report is adopted. And so that completes the reports from our standing committees. The next order of business is a notice of ordinance introductions. There is one notice that amends the street and sidewalk portion of the code that I am sponsoring, that is a complete revision of the two chapters related to parades and races and block events. Uh, this notice is hereby given and no further action is required at this time. I will comment that this potentially will be um, in support of you know some of our festivals, including the Pride Parade 
and, and other large events. Next, we have the introduction uh, and referral calendar. First, Council Member Rainville will be introducing and giving first reading to an ordinance amending the licensing code to amend provisions related to security operations and management of open air motor vehicle parking lots, which will be referred to the Business Inspection, Inspections, Housing and Zoning Committee. Second, Councilmember Wansley, Chavez, and Osmond will be introducing the subject matter of an ordinance amending the licensing code related to establishing minimum driver compensation for transportation ride share workers, which will be referred to the biz committee. And finally, council members Wansley, Chavez, and Osmond will be introducing the subject matter of an ordinance amending the licensing code related to transparency, safety, and worker protections for transportation ride share workers, which will be referred to the committee of the whole. Are there any questions from my colleagues on these introductions? First in queue is Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to provide some additional clarity about the uh, NOIs related to the ride share protections. Um, so CM, Chavez, Osmond, and myself reopened both chapters um, because we're starting or restarting the conversations with each council member um, as well as working to hear uh, the mayor's feedback uh, so that we can bring uh, amended ordinance when it's time to submit a draft for first reading. Um, we are doing a second round of these gatherings or meetings with every single council member to incorporate any additional feedback. Um, we're also following the legislative process and working with the clerks and the city attorneys every step of the way um, to make sure that we're bringing forward uh, changes that can also be uh, legally defensible. Um, we're also staying in touch with uh, drivers and national experts. Um, so we're really excited and looking forward to continuing these conversations um, with the goal of passing a policy that guarantees drivers and riders the rights that they deserve. So just want to provide some of that information. Thank you. Uh, Council Vice President Pamasano. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have some questions. I think there may be for the city attorney. Um, but before I ask them, I do want to point out that I think that Councilmember Wansley's office and the other offices that are engaged in this work have been doing a really good job. Um, I appreciate how you've been engaging all of us in what we want to see and how this might change. I think it's been very thorough thus far, um, and I do appreciate that. What I'm trying to understand is maybe a little bit more um, process oriented because this is this is an ordinance that was fully it went fully through the process. It was it, it went through the process, passed. It came back vetoed. It did not survive a veto override. It is perhaps the deadest piece of legislation that you know you can have. And then it's come back like a zombie into another introduction and referral, um, and and I appreciate, I guess, splitting it into two changes it, um, but I am worried, and I, it's not even about this, it's just about things in general. Like, has, has this language for something that has not survived a veto been reviewed by the city attorney's office? Could someone help me answer if, if this new language that's being brought forward today has been reviewed yet by the city attorney's office? Um. Uh, Council President, uh, CVP, um, so I don't think that our office has seen new ordinance language. Um, I, I, and maybe I'm, uh, Council Member Wansley can, can yeah. fill me in, but I, I think that what I'm hearing is that, that, um, that the authors are not actually, they haven't determined what amendments may or may not be, be part of this. Um, you know, what I, what I will say is that the, the Council's rules requires that in order for something to come back, it has to be substantively different. Whether this is or isn't, I have no idea because I haven't, I don't think we're at the point to know what the amendments are. Is that fair? Yeah, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Wansley. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to provide some clarification of where we are actually at in the legislative process. So all we did was 
uh, open the code. We have not even made it to the process of submitting language or doing a first reading, which is where we would involve, you know, an actual draft before you to consider. So there is no language, no ordinance currently before you for the purpose of us having meetings with every single council member, meeting with the mayor, getting that feedback, and then also working with the city attorneys and the clerks to then formalize amendments based off the feedback that's provided to us. So we're still very early in the legislative process. The idea that we have an ordinance in front of you, that is not where we're at. Madam Chair, if I may, um, you know, this is literally the first reading and you just said we don't have language for a first reading of something that has been killed off. It literally says first reading and introduction. Um, and, and I'm only picking on this one, I and mean, there's first readings and in, in referrals for the open air motor vehicle parking lots, but this one is different because it came through and was fully vetoed and has gone through the whole process once. So I'm just, I'm curious, and this actually relates to the to the process changes that we're looking to make, that I'm looking, that we're looking to have um, conversations with staff, conversations with colleagues about is about how we can do better by way of our process and when something has a first reading that it's available, the actual reading that it's actually touched and there's language for that reading. Um, but I, I believe we're voting to move this forward today. Um, but I'm curious at what point would the city attorney's office opine on, on is this substantively similar or dissimilar? I expect that by the end of the process, it might be dissimilar. But when through this process with the city attorney's office, as it is today, uh, opine on whether this is substantially different or not? Thank you, Council Vice President. Um, I, I will recognize uh, City Attorney Anderson to, to maybe respond to that. But I do think um, ultimately it's the, um, this body's decision to determine whether it is substantially different or not. However, um, I'll recognize the city attorney to offer some insight. Um, Council President, Council Vice President, um, so your, your questions are hard, hard to answer. Um, it, the, the issue is the interpretation of council rules. Um, obviously, to some degree, you have the flexibility to move things in, in process, suspend rules, interpret rules. Um, this particular rule about substantive difference comes from Robert's rules. Um, I imagine there might, might be some precedent out there to help guide the question of, of what is substantively different, what is not substantively different, you know, outside of the context of Robert's rules. I mean, substantive is something that's, it's a legal term of art that has uh, a meaning behind it and, and, and precedent behind it. It's just really hard to apply that precedent, the, the definitions to something that we just haven't seen. Um, so I, I hesitate to, to opine on whether something is or isn't substantively different when there's there's not enough detail to, to determine that, to apply that the, the law and the precedent to the facts. Council President, if I may, and then I'll be done. Well, you've had to. Um, it's just to statements. respond to her point. Um, Council Vice President. I, I just want to say that I think that the precedent that this is a precedent that then we're setting here, and I think that this is an opportunity for improvement in our rules in the future. That's all. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Council President Jenkins. This is super simple. It's a referral to a committee. Um, it's just a referral, and our clerk told us at the last council meeting that this body ultimately gets to make that decision if it's different or not. So we can have that conversation in, in the committee. We can have that conversation at full council. It's just a referral. I know that my colleague, Councilmember Chuck Tai, actually, who is sick, is here today because we couldn't confirm whether this policy, this referral to a committee was gonna die or not. We couldn't confirm that last night. So she's here literally sick in this meeting because of that, and that's just wrong in a referral and procedural vote, and I just want people to know that. 
So the more we talk about this, the more we debate about this, referral to committee, if people have issues, they can bring amendments. They can make changes, you can vote it down. We literally are, are meeting with every single council member to bring up their concerns. These are two different things. One is about minimum wage. The other one is about uh, driver's rights and rider's rights. Super simple, it doesn't have to be dramatic. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. I'm just gonna interject that I've heard like four times that you've talked to every single council member and I have not had one discussion with anyone about this topic. We have reached council out member Payne. We have reached out to every single That is not member. true. Yes, council member Payne. Council member Payne, please. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I have had the benefit of being briefed on the new uh, legislative process uh, along with you, council member president and council, council vice president. Um, and you know, uh, and I know the clerk is reaching out to all council offices to start these briefings around what this new process might look like. And I'm, what I wanna do is try to separate out this kind of transitional process conversation and what's the ideal process from the substance of this. And I think that you should vote on the substance of this on whether or not you wanna support drivers and that's your prerogative and that's what's before you today. Um, from a process perspective, uh, we have not implemented the new process. We're in the early stages of briefing. We have historically combined introduction, referral, and first reading. But we're actually gonna be separating that step out in the new process to have a first and second reading. So that by the time that we are actually starting to get into the substance, we actually have a much more formed um, language that we can actually make a determination about whether or not it's substantive or not. And that will be a part of the new process and we are working through that. And I've had deep conversations with Council Member Wansley about that. Her briefing's not until tomorrow. So let's separate out these process conversations about how we want to streamline the legislative process to the substance. And let's just take a vote on the substance. Do we want to move forward with driver protections today whether we're calling it a first reading, an introduction, a referral, a step A, B, C, D, set that aside and just ask yourself, do you want to move forward legislating driver protections? Yes or no? And we are gonna continue doing the work of improving our process and streamlining that. Thank you. Council Member Osmond. I'll just make it quick. Um, we are trying to improve and do the work that can get us all the support on the, of the body. I know the mayor has vetoed it, but uh, we'll make the necessary change and to make sure that uh, the work we're doing uh, benefits the, those that came here, uh, that are working, that are, are moving our city, um, moving forward. So uh, this is just the referral and everyone's uh, opinion and time uh, is, is you know, welcomed uh, for any input moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. Just wanted to uh, reiterate my comment. On September 18th, Celeste from Council Member Wansley's office reached out to all council members and all council staff about setting up meetings to talk about this exact thing. So your comments were inaccurate. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye on one, no on two. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye on one, no on two. Vice President Palmasano. Aye on one, no on two. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes on the report except for item number two, which has three nays. Thank you. Um, that carries and those um, ordinance are referred to committee for the next cycle. Madam President, before you move forward, there was a clerical error I wanted to highlight the body's attention to. The second item related to the introduction of an ordinance for amending the licensing code uh, is actually to the BIS, the BIHS committee, not to the committee of the whole. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was wondering what that was about. Thank you for that correction. Um, 
The next order of business is resolutions. We have one honorary resolution that was read at the beginning of the meeting. Are there any further comments from my colleagues? Saying none, um, I will entertain a motion to adopt that resolution. So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. Uh, that carries in those resolutions. That resolution has been adopted. The next item pertains to the application for rezoning. And this is under new unfinished business, I'm sorry. The next item pertains to the application for rezoning of properties on Van Buren and Summer Streets Northeast that was continued from the September 21st meeting. I'll call on the city attorney to provide us with legal advice as to whether or not the council can consider the rezoning application. Uh, council, I mean, I'm sorry, um, City Attorney Anderson. Uh, council President, Council Members, um, this matter um, is still wrapped up in the um, the uh, district court uh, determination of an injunction um, uh, with respect to the 2040 plan. If you recall, the city attorney's office has uh, moved the district court for a stay of that injunction pending appeal. We have appealed the 2040 uh, decision. There's a hearing on that matter on uh, October 10th. Um, so we may have more information uh, at that point in time, but right now the district court's injunction is in effect. And so uh, my advice would be to continue holding this unfin unfinished business over um, at, at least another cycle. Thank you, um, Madam City Attorney. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Um, seeing that clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That motion uh, passes. And Colleagues, we do have a request for a closed session today, but before we move to closed session, uh, I'll take up any announcements first. Do any of my council colleagues have announcements to share this morning? Uh, seeing no one in queue, I will note that um, October is National Invisibility Di Invisible Disabilities Month. Uh, as it relates to um, employment. And I will be bringing forth a resolution uh, at our next council meeting, but I wanted to just acknowledge uh, that and um, the incredible challenges that many people who have invisible disabilities as well as those um, who have visible disabilities, um, their um, create awareness around this issue. And as I say that I will be bringing forth a resolution at our next city council meeting. Um, with that, we have completed the regular items on our agenda and we'll now consider the request for a closed session, which is for one litigation matter um, listed on our agenda and before I move to close the meeting, I recognize the city attorney to provide legal basis for the requested closed session. Madam Council city President, attorney. Um, council members, the next item on the agenda is the case of um, the litigation matter of Battelle versus City of Minneapolis, a wor workers' compensation matter. These, this case um, is in, in active litigation. Your lawyers wish to discuss with the council lit litigation strategy and or settlement possibilities. Accordingly, under the Minnesota Open Meeting Law, Minnesota Statute Section 13D05, Subdivision 3B, 
the council may, upon a proper motion, close the meeting for the purposes of attorney-client communication. In considering the motion, the council should weigh the right of the public to know what its government is doing against the need of the city to preserve the confidentiality of its discussions with its attorneys. Thank you, Madam City Attorney. Um, with that, I move that our public meeting be closed as authorized under the provisions of the open meeting law, specifically Minnesota Statutes, Section 13D.05, Subdivision 3B, for the purpose of discussing the litigation matter of Battelle versus the City of Minneapolis. May I have a second to that? Uh, second. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. <clears throat> Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and we will now close the public portion of our meeting and convene in closed session. For the viewing public, I will note that the broadcast of this meeting will continue and the council will reconvene in public after we've concluded our closed session. Thank you.
Time is now 1237, and the council has reconvened an open session following our closed session. And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to verify the presence of a quorum. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Present. Goodman Excuse is me. absent. Council Member Wansley. Present. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Osmond. Present. Council Member Payne. Present. Council Member Koski. Present. Council Member Shugtai. Present. Council Member Chavez. Present. Council Member Ellison. Here. Council Member Vita. Present. Vice President <clears throat> Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Uh, let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. Colleagues, we will now consider um, the policy oversight government uh, committee's item number 17, which was set aside as part of that committee's report. The committee has recommended that the proposed workers' compensation settlement <clears throat> for Andrew Patel be referred to staff. Is there any discussion? I see council members Wansley, Ellison, and Vitao in queue. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I would like to uh, support the original motion that the POGO uh, committee uh, voted in terms of referring it to staff. Um, as I mentioned in committee, um, I have a number of concerns about uh, not only actually this particular case, but how we've handled our workers' comps uh, claims. Um, it's been troubling to know that, you know, by rubber stamping every claim, even when there's evidence of some officers having a pattern of lying, you know, we're still approving them, and that, that runs the risk of sitting or the city sig signaling to bad actors that this is an easy way out. Um, approving all settlements without question is not only unjust on a number of levels, it's just also feels like a bad strategy in this moment and a strategy that our residents ultimately have to pay for. And as of now, looking at over 30 million um, and our residents have been raising these concerns for some time. Um, so, you know, I'm really hoping that this body will uh, withstand the original um, recommendation from POGO um, and use this as an opportunity to show, you know, that with officers like Battelle, you know, if we're actually willing to go to court on claims that we believe are fraudulent, um, that maybe that will discourage, again, uh, other potential bad actors from actually utilizing a necessary welfare system, which is our workers' comps uh, system. Um, so I just want to I highlight that this is a really major opportunity to rethink how we're approaching our workers' comps work to set a different president and to create a new uh, pattern or culture, um, hopefully not only within City Hall around uh, workers' comps claim, but also statewide as we continue to pursue uh, changes to state statute that guides uh, PTSD claims. So um, I'll be supporting the original motion today and just wanted to state uh, some of my rationale uh, for the record. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I will also be supporting uh, the recommendation to refer this back to staff uh, and to not pass this today. Um, I do want to say that we have, we've seen a lot of these come before us. Um, it's been a topic of discussion for years now. And uh, I do want to thank staff for their diligence in how they've brought these before us and how um, in, in the work that they've done to bring us the best recommendation that they can. Uh, I think that this case uh, presents, my opinion is that these cases, that this case presents a unique set of circumstances um, and that, uh, there is, a, there is a moment where we have to figure out where we are going to draw some boundaries uh, in what we're doing and where we um, really bring the public in transparently in how this process works. Um, I don't think it's clear to the public. I think in the past it hasn't been clear to the council. I think it's certainly not clear to the legislature. And while I appreciate some of the changes that we've seen at the state, um, every municipality in the state of Minnesota is still burdened with this issue. Uh, and, so, uh, and so by sort of drawing a line here um, and sort of testing the waters, uh, 
if we are able to prevail in some way, I think we could be setting uh, a good pathway forward for other municipalities who are burdened by this issue. So um, I just want to say, you know, again, uh, I appreciate the staff of work. This is in no way an indictment of their work, um, uh, but uh, but I agree with the with the committee's uh, vote to refer this back to staff and to see if we can't get a better outcome for uh, taxpayers here in Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Ellison. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I actually wanted to offer a substitute motion to approve the workers' compensation claim for Andrew Vital by payment of $145,000. Um, Councilmember Vital has moved second the, um, a motion to accept, which has been seconded by um, Councilmember Rainbill, and I see for discussion Councilmember uh, Council Vice President Pamasano. I would also ask the City Attorney. Um, as I think we learned in our closed session that there was an error and that Madam President, I have to just jump in and answer to that. There's a clerical error on that motion that says 145,000 and it should be 150,000. So the clerical error would be to uh, cross out 145,000 and replace that with 150,000. Thank you. Are you okay with that, Councilmember Vito? Yes, Madam President. All right, um, so Councilmember Vitao has moved a substitute motion. It has been properly seconded, and I don't see is there discussion, is there comments or questions um, from my colleagues. Say none, um, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. <coughs> Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Nay. Councilmember Johnson. No. Councilmember Osmond. No. Councilmember Payne. No. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. No. Councilmember Chavez. No. Councilmember Ellison. No. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Nay. There are three ayes and nine nays. So that item fails, and we are back to the original motion to return this item. I'm not sure if it's to committee or to staff. Madam President, the motion was returned to staff, which would place this back in the uh, city attorney's office for further uh, work. And. And that work would be to well, what the city we... attorney speak to that. <laughs> um, Madam President, um, council members, my interpretation of uh, the motion passing to to go back to staff would be that you've rejected the settlement uh, of one hundred fifty thousand dollars for this claim, and that would um, put us back in. Uh, litigation, which could result in a, a different settlement being negotiated and brought to you, or could result in us um, proceeding to hearing. So we're we're all clear, and I, I guess we're saying we don't think staff has worked hard enough to resolve this case. I see the clerk shaking his head. Do you want to respond, sir? Madam President, it's not for me to say what the body is doing, but I, I think that characterization perhaps is um, not accurately reflective of the body. I think the body is saying that despite excellent work 
by staff, which I heard many of your colleagues state, there is a fundamental philosophical disagreement with um, settling at $150,000 this particular case and that instead the body is saying refer this back to the city attorney's office so that either, as the city attorney has just indicated, further negotiations on a future potential settlement or uh, proceeding to a hearing would, would be the outcome of that. But I don't think it was um, characterizing a lack of effort or uh, work by the staff. I would concur with the clerk. Thank you. Um, so we have our original motion to return this to staff and seeing no further discussion, clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Rainville. No. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osmond. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Kosky. Aye. Council Member Shagtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are nine ayes and three nays. That item carries, and item number 17 is returned to our city attorneys for further um, actions. And um, seeing no further business to come before this body, um, and without objection, this meeting is adjourned.